Okay. <clears throat> so reproductive system, this, uh, like everything else, it's uh, constantly changing as society changes in terms of the clinical need and the epidemiology and the opportunities for bioengineers. And uh, like anything, there's um, uh, a big opportunity. Uh, and uh, we'll try to cover the basic anatomy, uh, basic physiological and pathological processes, and then talk about drugs and devices that <clears throat> are uh, uh, both that exist and opportunities for further development. Uh, start uh, male. So we have a generation of uh, sperm in the uh, testis, as you probably know. Uh, there are uh, incredibly complex networks of tubules that uh, give rise to the sperm. There are stem cells that are generating them. Uh, and uh, that is under very tight hormonal control. Uh, indirectly, uh, directly from the brain uh, uh, via uh, hormones that regulate the production of testosterone. And there's a complex uh, uh, composition of the uh, uh, final ejaculate that includes uh, not just sperm, of course, but uh, fluids from various glands along the uh, pathway, including the prostate, the seminal vesicles, and the Cowper's glands that are positioned at different stages along the uh, pathway. Things end up getting uh, funneled uh, through the vas deferens, uh, and ejaculation happening uh, pathway through the penis. Head of the epididymis is right here. It's positioned on top of the uh, testis, and you can see some of the complexity of the seminiferous. Uh, that each, of each of these has its own compartments for generation of uh, sperm. Now, what are all these different uh, compositions? These glands are secreting additional things that. Uh, that end up getting injected into the tubule at various uh, locations along the anatomical pathway. Uh, the seminal vesicles generate uh, prostaglandins. Um, these might have a direct effect on the sperm in terms of motility. They probably also have an effect uh, uh, downstream by uh, triggering muscular contractions uh, on cell anatomy. There's high concentrations of fructose for uh, uh, metabolic needs of the sperm itself. They have very uh, high of course, metabolic needs, um, active cells. Uh, prostate generates uh, zinc, which turns out to be crucial uh, for um, fertility. Um, also contains uh, acid buffers, which are important for fertilization. Acid as well. The bulbal urethral glands generate mucus and additional buffers. The end result is you have something that's uh, highly viscous, highly buffered, uh, has high concentration of uh, 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 fructose and uh, uh, nourishing substances for the sperm, which uh, they'll need in their journey. And then there's uh, some interesting anatomy of the spermatozoa itself. So you've got this long uh, tail, it's a flagellum, uh, and this cell dr driven by a microtubule uh, network. And then uh, you've got a nucleus, basically it's a free system for nucleus, but you've got uh, also at the head of it, you've got the acrosome that enzymes that are needed to digest the uh, zona pellucida of the uh, oocyte. Now, um, you probably know that normal sperm development occurs below core body temperature, two to three degrees Fahrenheit below. Uh, if there's impaired uh, descent of testes out of the abdominal cavity, that's a, a cause for infertility. Um, and so there's a, a constant regulation of the uh, environment within the uh, Testis uh, in terms of temperature for reasons that are not uh, fully understood, but are very uh, female side basic anatomy. Again, we'll you know a lot of you have encountered this in, in classwork at various times before, and we'll, uh, but just as a brief uh, uh, overview. So the uh, interesting feature of the uh, anatomy is you've got the uh, ovaries where the uh, egg cells are generated. Um, there's this uh, connectivity to the uh, fallopian tubes, which is not uh, absolute. You know, this is, is actually uh, the tubes sort of envelop the ovaries, but it's not a tight anatomical linkage. And uh, it definitely can happen in certain pathological situations that eggs can end up not getting into the fallopian tube. Uh, but those are then tightly connected to the uh, uterus and to the vagina. Our muscular layers. Uh, of course, not just in the uterus, but in the fallopian tubes themselves that help uh, uh, propel uh, the uh, egg toward the uterus as well as uh, cilia. Uh, 
it's got a, a sweeping motion that uh, drives the directionality. Anything can go wrong along that pathway if you've got impaired uh, muscular action, impaired cilia, if you have uh, endometriosis, which is altered uh, composition of the lining of the fallopian tubes due to presence of uterine lining tissue that's in the wrong place. If you have uterine lining tissue out in the fallopian tubes, you have a number of problems, including infertility, because you've got, among other problems, impaired um, propagation of the egg towards the uterus. Yeah? You know, it's not uh, completely clear. I don't know why it's set up that way. Uh, you might imagine uh, it would be a, a, a tighter junction. I think it's uh, the anatomical source of these uh, germ tissues uh, is, is very different from everything else. And so it may be a fundamental developmental constraint. I don't know uh, uh, what you guys think. It's, it's been an interesting uh, uh, thing. And it, it, usually it's not a problem. So it's a kind of heavily optimized, I think, with evolution. Um, we have uh, uh, then a lot of interesting aspects in the uh, uterine wall itself. It's a very uh, powerful muscle. Um, it has multiple layers. The thickest layer is this uh, myometrium. It's uh, powerful. Uh, and it's got uh, coating on either sides, the uh, endometrium being the most significant fertility aspect. That's the lining that's found in the or implantation. And again, it's this lining that can appear in uh, ectopic or abnormal locations, not only in the fallopian tubes, but it can sneak out into the uh, abdominal cavity. And so you get these very problematic uh, sources of tissue that uh, uh, still respond in a cyclical fashion and, and have uh, sort of cycles of uh, generation and, and, and apoptotic uh, death. And that creates huge uh, uh, pain and bleeding problems in uh, addition to the infertility issue. Um, the uh, follicles are in the ovary. They generate the egg. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, women are born with all the eggs they'll have in their lifetime, start with about a million, uh, drops off uh, with age even down to 300,000 at the time of uh, puberty. And there's this uh, sort of rise in chromosomal abnormalities over time that is, correlates with a drop in uh, implantation uh, efficiency. And so it's always a an interesting question, you know, can, as we try to optimize our biology with new technology, there's always this question, can we uh, uh, generate uh, germ cells? Um, turns out there probably are stem cells in the ovary that can uh, potentially generate new uh, uh, oocytes. And there's a question as to whether those can be recruited by specific signals and lead to uh, help counteract some of these processes by generation of new uh, Yeah, the, the, the y-axis actually, I'm sorry, the y-axis got cut off here, but there's different, uh, obviously, y-axis for these two very different processes. And, and the uh, implantation uh, efficiency, of course, that's going to be measured as a, there's going to be a time denominator as well, implant efficiency, implantation efficiency per, you know, per month or per year. And uh, we'll try to get you a version that doesn't have the y-axis cut off. But this, the point of this was just to show the overall uh, process over time. Yeah, we'll, yeah, actually, we'll get to that interaction a little later. There's a, a glycoprotein that uh, is involved in that interaction. Um, it is pretty interesting. And of course, then there's, and there's issues, you know, there, there's possibilities, other ways to get around this issue besides the stem cell-based generation of new uh, eggs. You could, there are ways uh, that people are looking at to, you know, freeze uh, eggs themselves and so on. We'll get to that a little bit later, too. Uh, but so you've got this uh, cyclical generation of the uh, uterine lining. Um, key things to note here is that um, there's this point mid-cycle, day 14, when ovulation happens and it's preceded. That's when the egg gets released from the follicle in the ovary and starts its progression down the 
tubes. And you can see what everything else that's going on along the. Uh, a couple interesting things. Uh, there's a peak in these two uh, hormones, the gonadotrophic uh, hormones, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone, that peak just before ovulation. And so that's a pretty useful potential marker for fertility. Uh, and then there's this uh, slight change in uh, basal body temperature, which if you collect baselines uh, pretty carefully, then it's pretty detectable as a, a peak temperature. <clears throat> uh, this is called the follicular phase, and this is called the luteal phase because the follicle leaves behind this uh, element, the corpus luteum, that plays a role in uh, secreting uh, hormones like progesterone that help maintain the Um, and just a little more detail on this. Typically, uh, several follicles, follicles start to mature, and then there's this uh, uh, competition, sort of a winner take all, where uh, when one uh, starts to secrete estrogen, it inhibits uh, the others, and so you end up with usually just one and, uh, releasing, of course. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you have two, and that uh, contributes to births. But typically, only one uh, dominant uh, follicle uh, uh, survives and releases. Um, and that is driven in large part by the progesterone peak happens in the second phase in 